The Safe Airway Society, or SAS, is the INS professional airway society for Australia and New Zealand. Our members come from a wide variety of health professions. From the outset we've tried to include everybody that's involved in airway management, but we also represent patients and their families. And we feel like that makes us unique amongst airway societies worldwide. There are three main reasons why SAS has been created. Um, and in three words, that's connection, collaboration and patient safety. So in terms of connection, uh, we recognise that within and across Australia and New Zealand, we have some quite unique uh, geographical challenges of distance and environment. What we aim to do and achieve is to connect people from all corners of Australia and New Zealand. Which leads us to the next reason being collaboration, and that's a collaboration of professions. A collaboration of skills, knowledge and expertise, uh, collaboration and research and education. And that kind of takes us to the main reason being patient safety. So we're there primarily to promote airway management and safe practices in airway management, regardless of your profession or where you work. Historically, airway management was really the remit of the anaesthetist, but contemporary medicine Airway management is occurring all over the hospital and pre hospitally so critical care clinicians, range bank patients in the intensive care unit, emergency physicians in the emergency department, and then either pre-hospital clinicians or paramedics in the pre-hospital environments. The concept of SAS is really the idea of cross-pollination and bringing the expertise from all those different interprofessional groups to promote best airway practice in all the settings that it can occur. Overall, airway management is very safe and effective. However, there are still incidents now where patients can get seriously injured or even die. What we want to do is create an environment where safe and effective airway management is delivered to all patients. The way we're hoping to, to do that is to create better resources, to improve the existing systems that we've got already, and also through education and research. So we want to look at how we work as humans, as well as how we work together as a team. A complex healthcare challenge needs an interprofessional collaborative approach. Join us at safeairwaysociety.org. Welcome back everyone. This is SAS 2021 Team Skills, Skilled Teams. We're up to segment 2.4 and our patient journey now sees us entering the operating theatre. Joining us on the panel are Sheila Mahatra, an anaesthetist and an intensivist from India and an invited keynote speaker at almost any international airway conference you've ever been to. <laughs> Cassandra Sue, an anaesthetic nurse and one of the airway equipment and training leads at Royal North Shore in Sydney. And last but not least, Louise Allard, who's been chairing the sessions prior to this. As our OR team prepares to manage uh, this patient's airway, our panel and uh, our, our, our viewers will explore whether a complete airway strategy is really necessary or is just a defeatist admission that your plan A is not up to scratch. Whether a strategy that exists only in the mind of the primary airway operator is really a strategy or just an aspiration. And finally, what team structure and dynamics are required to ensure a strategy can be successfully enacted? We're also going to look at a combined video laryngoscope fiber optic technique alluded to by John earlier, um, which can be used specifically for patients with traumatic airway injuries or with the potential for a disrupted airway and comparing this to a more conventional, if I can use that term with such a new technique, combined VL um, five scope technique. Just to recap where we're at, our patient's on the way up to uh, theatre. He's been stabilised through a combination of uh, high flow nasal oxygen, some nebulised adrenaline and some steroids. His obs are relatively stable. He's still unwilling to lie flat for the CT scan. He's come straight to the theatre. He needs his airway secured. His sats are relatively stable on, an, on high flow nasal oxygen. Forget the non rebreather you can see on your screen. Respiratory rate sitting at 22. The team is assembled in OT and in the operating theatre, and we're going to pick it up from there. Sheila, I want to go to you first. 
In the, um, the NAP4 report, the authors recommended that all episodes of airway management be managed with a strategy, specifically a series of logical plans, a primary plan and a number of contingency plans designed to avoid hypoxia and aspiration. In situations like this one, where we've got time to plan and times to get things right, do we really need a backup plan or should we just get plan A right the first time? Thank you for that question. This is really very important. It doesn't matter whether you're in a situation where you have enough time or it's a semi-emergent situation or an emergency. You must communicate your plan with your team and definitely have a backup plan in any situation. Uh, this is paramount because whatever your plan is, even if it is an awake technique, can always fail. So you have to have a backup plan and it needs to be communicated with the team so that everything can be kept uh, ready. Of course, this can be a challenge in a semi-emergency. Uh, there may not be enough time to uh, get put things together and get them ready. But you have to make the best of the situation and at least communicate this with your team, what your plan is. Fantastic. Now, John, looking at your presentation, you suggest in your presentation that things can even go wrong with an awake technique. And I think that would probably surprise a number of our viewers who would think if we're doing it awake, you don't need backup plans. Tell us how things can go wrong with an awake technique. Well, in a compromised airway, particularly a patient uh, like we were discussing here, there's a risk of airway failure and loss of oxygenation. And in this particular patient, if if you, let's say you decide to put in the sleeve RS item and you couldn't get your tube in your first pass, then you're gonna to have to resort to positive pressure ventilation to reoxygenate them. And with the laryngeal tracheal injury with subcutaneous air, that could worsen and create massive subcutaneous emphysema in the neck structures and make intubation exceedingly difficult or maybe even impossible. So uh, definitely with any awake, uh, awake technique, there's always a, a risk of uh, failure and worsening of the situation which I think is a high risk in a patient such as this. So is it reasonable to say that you would approach any awake uh, technique, particularly in a critical situation like this, with a series of backup plans um, if things don't go right? Right. Absolutely. You know, the ultimate rescue is going to be a surgical airway. And unfortunately, mm -hmm. in this particular patient, the injury is over the cricothyroid membrane. Mm -hmm. So rapid surgical access is not going to be possible, which means you have to do a tracheotomy, which takes longer. So if this patient had a, a, a intact cricothyroid membrane and a cric could be done, I think awake intubation might be an option. But if awake has a catastrophic failure and you have to go on the surgical airway, then you're talking about a very time consuming surgical airway with a tracheostomy. And I think that's just not a reasonable plan, which is why I advocated for the, to start with awake tracheostomy in a patient such as this. Fantastic, thanks, John. Now, Cass, uh... Sheila intimated before that she likes to communicate her strategy, but I've observed that frequently the airway strategy, if there is one, is not clearly communicated to the anaesthetic assistant and to the team beyond the initial plan. Why is communication so important to you as an airway assistant and for the team overall in these time critical situations? It's vital for a number of reasons. First and foremost, to understand the complexity of the airway trauma. Each case is different um, due to the patient condition, availability and setting. Um, secondly, to gather resources to prepare for the initial plan um, and the contingency plan. On the same page of the anaesthetist is very important, knowing the technique and understanding what equipment you're going to be handing first. Um, there might be issues with resource availability, with what is on floor and what's available at the time. Um, what staff have the skills, like there are some nurses which I would prefer to have in the room um, <laughs> as opposed to others. Um, and it offloads the cognitive task through resource gathering and preparation from the airway lead. Um, that so sounds analyze good. Additional I've noticed there. frequently when I've uh, discussed plans with you that you've managed to sort of uh, road test and even poke holes in my plans and um, very <laughs> subtly push me in a uh, in a more sensible direction. Um, do you think there's a role Definitely. for the um, the team and particularly the airway assistant being part of the planning process? Yes, definitely. Um, the, yeah, it's, it's very important that the uh, is on the same page to kind of understand from experience um, what may and may not work for the patient um, in terms of the airway um, and if there's any 
suggestions or advice that we could give from previous experience as well. Fantastic, thank you. Now, Louise, I feel like our critical care colleagues are a few steps ahead of us in recognising the sort of cognitive li limitations on the primary airway operator in that they seem to separate the roles of leadership, um, coordination and technical management. Do you see a role for hands-off leadership during operating theatre airway management and how would you go about doing it? Yeah, look, I, I agree with you, Adam. I think um, in the operating room, it doesn't come particularly naturally um, to, to designate a, a hands-off leader. Uh, there's clear benefits. Um, it, it allows the primary air, airway operator to focus on the task at hand. Uh, it avoids tasks being sort of rushed over or forgotten and it allows that sort of the team leader to, to say things like, you know, are we sure that that was our best effort at a given lifeline? Um, it really aligns the team's understanding um, and creates that shared mental model that we've heard a lot about today. Uh, you know, statements like, um, we're, in the green, we're in the green zone or we're priming for Kaiko Rescue. Um, and it also gives the various um, assistants, um, you know, a focus point who to direct questions to. Um, I think we have to recognise that mid-crisis, uh, it's unlikely that the primary anaesthetist is probably going to have the ability to make this suggestion. Um, so what I've seen work really well is, is that when someone who comes into the situation who isn't the primary anaesthetist um, will come in and say, you know, Adam, why don't you continue what you're doing? Are you happy for me to be team leader and coordinate? Um, or alternatively, in some situations, it might be better for that new person to come in and say, Adam, are you happy that I take over whatever you're doing and you assume the leadership role? Um, and, and obviously, you know, whether you're in hours and you have an abundance of people or after hours will determine just, um, you know, who, who might be able to take on that, that hands-on role, hands-off role. Yeah, I feel like we've, we've fought a long battle in the operating theatre to overcome the old surgical paradigm of the captain of the ship and the surgeon shouldn't be questioned in the middle of a crisis. Um, and, and that maybe some of that attitude has worn off on us as well and that the operating theatre has been a, a bit of a slow learner in terms of the, um, the cognitive load issues. Um, I'm going to just update where we're at. So the patient's now arrived in the operating theatre and to remind our viewers and our panel members, we've got a largest gentleman who's refusing to lie flat, so we've uh, placed him in the operating table in a sitting position. You'll remember that he had a nasendoscopy showing a relatively swollen and distorted upper airway, um, probably hiding somewhere below that. It's not probably, definitely some sort of a airway um, disruption causing some pretracheal um, subcutaneous emphysema there. And the location of the airway is somewhere around, probably around the glottis. Um, so we've already heard that if a surgical procedure is required, it's going to have to be below the level of that injury. Um, I'm going to come back to you now, Sheila, and put you under the, under the spotlight. What's your strategy here? And specifically, how does the poor patient compliance and the pres presence of subcutaneous emphysema impact your decision making in this case? Right. Uh, thank you for that. Um, this is quite a complicated case because there are a lot of issues with this patient. First of all, uh, he's had uh, trauma and we're not sure if he's had any head injury. So he needs a scan, which he hasn't had yet, though he didn't have, um, you know, his level of consciousness is fine and he's relatively stable. The other thing I'm concerned about is uh, the subcutaneous emphysema. And this is quite an obvious sign. When you have emphysema, it means there is a breach in the tracheobronchial tree somewhere. So there is some airway injury and this might, uh, you know, the patient might have a pneumothorax. And since it's difficult to get an X-ray or a CT scan, I would do a lung ultrasound to rule out uh, any pneumothorax because this would worsen if I secured the airway and gave positive pressure uh, ventilation. And you might be in a situation where you might even have a tension pneumothorax. So you have to keep these two things in mind that this patient, though he's stable now, can acutely deteriorate at any point. So you have to have a plan for this acute deterioration in his, uh, you know, physiological condition due to deterioration of uh, either the head injury or uh, because of this airway injury. We have a nasal endoscopy done, but we don't know what's, uh, you know, lower down, what is the level of the injury. Since he's relatively stable, 
um, I would like to examine the airway using a flexible bronchoscope. Uh, what's most important is this patient is unlikely to be uh, cooperative, he's unable to lie flat. So counseling the patient, speaking to him is very important. And then discussing with your team what you're going to be doing, in, what your plan is and what is your backup plan and what if all this fails. And as uh, John has rightly said, um, you know, a, a surgical tracheostomy under local might be the best plan option for this patient if there is a lot of upper airway injury after examination. Uh, so you need to have your surgeon uh, absolutely there ready to do a surgical tracheostomy because a cricothyroidomy uh, may not be an option because of the upper airway injury. Considering this patient is relatively stable, I would take a chance of examining this airway. I would oxygenate him throughout. I would uh, start um, high nasal oxygen for this patient. Communicate with the team that first we're going to do a uh, nasal, I mean, uh, uh, endoscopy, I mean, flexible bronchoscopy. Try to examine uh, the airway and see what size tube will go. What is the level of the injury below what we've seen uh, from the nasal endoscopy? And if this plan fails, then we have to be ready. Uh, you know, supraglottic airway may not be an option because you already have the upper airway has uh, a lot of edema. So we may have to do a neck rescue. So backup plan for this. In addition to this, it's very difficult to prepare these patients for an awake procedure, uh, unlike other cases, uh, because they might get, you know, they, getting hypoxic, they might get very rowdy, they might be uncooperative. It's difficult to give a uh, local anesthetic. So often you'll just have to have very good counseling and spray as you go. Uh, as John has mentioned, uh, you know, you have to distinguish between just a difficult airway and a compromised airway. And this airway could get compromised, it could deteriorate. Uh, so, you you know, giving uh, any amount of sedation also would be a challenge. So I would just like to have a good communication with the patient and have this uh, backup plan of next rescue and go ahead with, you know, just spray as you go and try to examine the airway and see if I can secure the airway from above and have my team ready uh, just in case things go wrong, including the surgeon to do a, a tracheostomy. Fantastic. So I take from what you're saying there that there's no perfect primary plan and you've just got to take into account all of the factors, back yourself with a plan, but really be, be clear that you're going to have a series of contingency plans if that doesn't go exactly as you had hoped. Now, interestingly, um, I, I saw a combined technique described for the first time um, about three or four years ago by, and I referred to these guys earlier, Mercer and Groom and their team from the Aintree Hospital in Liverpool. And they have, I won't say the fortune, maybe the misfortune to be co-located with a prison. And they see a disproportionate number of hangings and attempted hangings in their emergency department. And as part of their approach to um, the uh, acute airway injuries, they developed this combined technique which uh, is essentially a fiber optic assisted rapid sequence induction. We've um, abbreviated that to Farsi here and apologies to our Persian viewers um, for appropriating their language here, um, but it just uh, was a nice way to differentiate it from the VAFI, the video assisted fiber optic intubation, which a lot of people are practicing at the moment. And we wanted to take this opportunity to differentiate the two techniques both the context and the performance. And the contexts are different. This FASI, this fiber optic assisted rapid sequence induction is really designed for speed and in use where there might be a injury below the vocal cords that might cause a false passage or a disruption. Whereas the VAFI is used when we're anticipating difficulty with a, fiber, with a video laryngoscope led in intubation. So we're going to watch a short video here where I went to the sim lab to try to demonstrate the differences and we might get the panel to um, comment afterwards. So the first uh, technique that we're going to go through in real time is the um, video assisted flexible bronchoscopic intubation or video assisted fiber optic intubation and remember this is a technique designed for an anticipated difficult intubation or unanticipated where you've failed with flex, uh, with video laryngoscopy and you now need to introduce the fiber optic Wait, scope to make the sense. difference between this technique and the fiber optic assisted rsi is with this technique we've got the tube loaded onto the fiber optic scope and we're using the fiber optic scope to find our way to 
the vocal cords, which we anticipate to be quite difficult. First stage is to insert your video laryngoscope. In this case, I've chosen a hyperangulated blade to try to achieve as much space for the fiber optic um, scope to pass through to get to the cords. I move out of the way, create some space for Bill to now perform an oral flexible bronch intubation. He's through the cords. As you can see, he's identified the carina at which point he's going to pass the tube. I'll leave the video laryngoscope in situ until the tube's in place. That creates space for passage, but it also allows me to identify that we're in the right spot. Bill can still see the carina. That's a second point of confirmation. And our third point of confirmation is going to be in tidal CO2. All right, so the technique that I'm going to run you through now is the flexible bronch assisted RSI. And this is a technique that we specifically utilize where we've got a suspected or possible um, disruption of the trachea below the vocal cords. And the difference here is that I don't have the tube loaded on the scope. I'm gonna go about a rapid sequence induction as I normally would. Um, and basically at the point that I get the tube to the, um, to the glottis, I'm now going to stop at that point. I'm not passing the bevel of the tube much beyond the cords or basically at the cords. And I'm going to get Bill to come in and rapidly pass the scope beyond any disruption that might be in the trachea. And that allows a sort of a cell dinger technique for us to pa safely pass the tube beyond any disruption. At that point, we come out. Again, we don't want to ventilate until we've got air in the cuff because that risks making any uh, subcutaneous emphysema worse. So that's the rapid sequence, uh, fiber optic assisted rapid sequence induction. All right, and we're back. So that was a real, like a whirlwind run through um, two uh, techniques combining um, both the fiber optic scope and the video laryngoscope. Has uh, any of our panel had any real life experience with either of those techniques or would like to comment on those techniques? Uh, if I may say something uh, about this yeah. technique. Yeah. So I do uh, use this technique sometimes. It's called, some people call it the hybrid or Wafi. There are different uh, terms for this. Now, when you, when you do a flexible uh, bronchoscopic intubation, the passage of the tube is still blind though you are able to visualize the trachea and you know the passage is blind so you might have the tube often abutting against the arytenoid or difficulty in passage of the tube so using a combined technique where you also use the uh, video laryngoscope uh, really can help you and also in the situation setting that you just described where there is uh, some upper airway injury this can be a safer technique to use a combined technique but of course it trained in this technique fantastic thanks sheila um, we did have a question via text here, um, and it's a question for you, Cass. Um, they've said, listening to Sheila's strategy, it sounds like there's a number of moving parts. Would this be a scenario where you'd be comfortable as a solo airway assistant, or would you want, want help here? And how would you divide up the roles if you had some help? Pair of hands in any given airway emergency is always useful. Um, there's always, there's a lot of setup with the, um, you know, situation at hand, high flow, um, getting ready for the Kaiko, um, a runner for unspecific un resources, basically an extra pair of hand for equipment handling and preparation. Um, occasionally the setting might just be very awkward and so a secondary person on the opposing side of the bed or something might prove handy um, due to, and with different experience working with different anesthetists um, and the different techniques, um, an extra pair of hands will yeah will just be handy i guess um i'm in favor in terms of dividing the roles i'm in favor of the main anesthetic nurse um being the main person that the anesthetist will communicate to only because it streamlines any confusion um it offloads the task to the main anesthetic nurse then delegate to the extra anesthetic nurses that might come come across um yeah for the setup and whatnot Thanks, Cass. And I guess that question around uh, how many uh, airway assistants you need also raises the question of personnel uh, from an anaesthetic or an airway operator technique. Louise, how many 
people, uh, airway operators or anaesthetists, would you have in the room? And where does the surgeon's role lie within this um, procedure or this uh, strategy? Yeah, well, Adam, we all know that this patient's going to come in at three o'clock in the morning, aren't they? You know, we're probably not going to be in operating room utopia and have, you know, an infinite number of people. Um, so I, I think one of the considerations, if you're going to do a complex technique that involves, you know, two critical components, um, I think it's nice to think about if one of those tasks derives benefit from previous performance of that task. Um, or if one of the tasks is kind of easier to explain to someone else. And what I mean by that is, about, although both the video laryngoscope and the fiber optic bronchoscope are, are critical components, if you've never ever picked up a bronchoscope before, that's pretty daunting to be assigned that task. Um, whereas if you've never handled a video laryngoscope before, it's probably a little bit easier to guide that technique. Um, so you could find the view together and then ask your anesthetic assistant to maintain that view. Um, so I guess if, if we're in anaesthetic um, operating room utopia and you had two senior anaesthetists, you had an anaesthetic trainee and you had um, two anaesthesia assistants, I'd have uh, a primary anaesthetist on the fibre optic bronchoscope, I'd have an anaesthesia trainee on the video laryngoscope and, and hopefully managing sedation as well and I'd have that second consultant anaesthetist as that team leader who can keep that sort of situational awareness for all of us. Um, and then I'd, I'd see if we could have one primary um, airway assistant to assist um, with the, the, the task at hand and then a second airway assistant that could act as a bit of a runner and as Cass just suggested, um, you know, having the equipment available for a, a Kaiko uh, if, that, um, if that were needed. Um, as you mentioned, Adam, um, you know, after hours, if we are quite limited, um, you know, the, the other person um, handling um, the, the video laryngoscope could be the surgeon, um, the ED physician that's followed the, the, the patient up to the operating room, the, the intensive care physician uh, that's come around to assist. Um, so, you know, I think we just have to adapt to, to the time of day and the number of people that we have available to us. So what I'm hearing you say is that not all soldiers are interchangeable and not all techniques are the same and that you have to, to assess the skill set of the people you've got and think carefully about who does what. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, as I said, it would be pretty daunting to be handed a bronchoscope having never handled one before if you're the orthopaedic surgeon in the room. Um, but, uh, you know, th th there are you know, plenty of, of those other really critical tasks that I think you can, um, you know, with the, with the primary airway physician can talk uh, assistance through. Okay, so I'm not sure whether Nick's come into the screen here because he disagrees because neck rescue wasn't used. Or whether no, we've got some she, questions Sheila has, here, so. Sheila has said neck rescue several times. Okay. Sheila is my partner in crime with critical language. Um, we've got a question here that I think is interesting. I think the, the way I think about these two techniques is that the um, bronchoscopic assisted um, uh, video, video intubation is really about using the um, flexible, flexible scope to deliver the tube whereas the fiber flexible assisted RSI is about using the tube to deliver the flexible bronchoscope. Um, so the, the question we've got here is from Alison Williams who asks, what's the advantage of not inserting the scope first in the FASI technique? And then I'm gonna come back about the terminology here. So really the, the theoretical advantage is the speed, um, that you've got an additional time of actually getting the fiber optic scope to the vocal cords because the fiber optic scope is not rigid. Um, you're sort of reliant on um, everything working quickly. Whereas uh, we know with a rapid sequence induction that from the time you put the laryngoscope in the mouth and then it, it really takes no time at all to deliver a tube with a preformed shape um, to the vocal cords. So it's all about tube. But the reality is a lot of these patients are going to be multi-trauma patients who are going to be in a neutral position where we're probably our preferred blade is probably going to be a hyperangulated blade. The patients are going to be in um, inline with manual inline stabilization. So that option is going to be out anyway in that situation where you're using a hyperangulated blade because a tube without a, some sort of a stylus or a bougie being used is not going to get you to the vocal cords. So in that situation, you may need to revert to a, a VAFI technique where you're actually using the um, the video the, the fiber optic scope as a steerable bougie to get you to the tubes to the cords sorry
Nick, was there any other questions? You yeah, to? so another question here that I just think nicely illustrates some issues around language. So uh, we've got a question here, is dual setup technique or uh, double setup technique similar to hybrid intubation? And I think this just raises this problem that John and I was discussing recently, and I'm sure Sheila will be interested in, is this idea that um, we, we use terms like combined technique, du dual technique, hybrid technique. Now, th these are quite different techniques. The, the double setup is a priming for neck rescue technique, and the hybrid um, technique is a, an, an, uh, an awake or, or a sleep intubation technique. I might just get John because a lot of emergency, a lot of non-emergency physicians aren't familiar with the term double setup. John, do you just want to explain to us what what's meant by the double setup in ED? Uh, the double setup was a term we came back uh, up with uh, many years ago to dis dis uh, describe a rescue technique, and um, some patients in the emergency department um, are too uncooperative for awake intubation, so you're forced to do an RSI. And when you're forced to do an RSI in a difficult situation, uh, we call a double setup is RSI with a backup surgical airway that's ready to go if the RSI fails. So that's what we talk about double setup. It's your primary technique with an immediate surgical rescue technique uh, ready to go. Okay. And that's in, in, in Vortex terminology, that would be taking the priming status to, to set. Um, Sheila, I'll just come to you. In terms of terminology for these techniques, I know you're a, a big believer in having clear critical language. How would you refer, if you were going to do a, a hybrid combined dual technique intubation, if you, a combined um, flexible bronchoscopic and rigid video laryngoscopic technique, how, how would you describe this to your team? Would you be using these VAFI, VAFI dual technique uh, terms or what, what would you say? So I don't like to use uh, acronyms because they're often misunderstood. I'd like to be more specific. You know, hybrid could mean anything. Dual technique could mean anything. So I would say uh, a combined uh, video laryngoscope and flexible bronchoscope. I just specify what I mean. Because there are a lot of combined techniques. There are a lot of hybrid techniques. So I, I would like to be specific and not use acronyms. I, I agree with you. Don't like acronyms. Acronyms say what you mean. Adam, back to you. All right, so at this point, we're going to say goodbye to one of our panellists. Cass, so thanks so much for joining us. And uh, in a moment, we're going to be back with 2.5, where our patient is, uh, where we start to think about the extubation of the patient. From this session, I think we unanimously agree that airway management, particularly complex or time-critical airway management, needs to be approached with a strategy, not just a plan. And importantly, that strategy needs to be communicated and road tested with the team. For a strategy to stay on track when things don't necessarily go as planned, there should be clear role allocation, including a hands-off leader. Finally, there may be a role for incorporation of a flexible bronchoscope into an RSI te technique in situations where there may be an airway disruption. So we'll be back in a couple of minutes after a short message from our sponsors.